So it's a very dynamic situation in which we did not see any Democrats cross over the line last session and vote in favor of school choice proposals. I think there's a world in which a couple would. Mm -hmm. Um, It depends on what kind of guardrails and whatnot they put on it, if there are any. I don't know. Yeah, what kind of bracketing is involved. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously, you know, Abbott's spiking the football on the success of this crusade. Okay, Brad, when you say spiking the football, what does that even mean? You know Gronk when he scores a touchdown? Oh, it's like a celebra- like yes. a celebration. Yes. Okay. Wow. Got it. I didn't think I'd have to explain something so simple. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> there's our there's our feuding for the the, the episode. <laughs> We've been so nice to each yeah, other. Right. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Smoke Filled Room podcast with myself, Brad Johnson, and the distinguished senior editor. Mackenzie, I almost called you Taylor. I almost dead <laughs> I named you. Mackenzie DeLulo. Um, we have been tasked with, among a bunch of other offerings that we're bringing up at the Texan, to do a podcast that is at least in name about Texas politics. But really, it's about us arguing. And when we say we've been tasked with it, we mean we've assigned this to ourselves. Yeah. I don't know if you'd call it a labor of love. No. But. But at the time, it sounded fun. Yes. We'll see how much enjoyment we actually get out of this. This will be interesting. I mean, you've already dead named me, so. Right. Almost. Almost. (sighs) Lord in heaven. So this, for our inaugural episode, we are going to talk about the primaries, the absolute um, bloodletting that it was in the Texas House. A bloodbath, as some distinguished reporters have. Yes. Some have been calling it that. (laughs) Um, I'm not going to say I, you know, made fetch happen with that, but <laughs> this is the I made fourth time happen. this week that Brad has said that he made fetch yeah. happen. Yeah, <laughs> it's my top accomplishment of this uh, this five year stretch. Of, That's saying um, something. You know, doing this, yeah. So speaking of five year stretch, um, and relating to what happened in the Texas primary, we're going to talk about how it relates to the big scandal that happened when we first launched that you covered. Uh, about Speaker Dennis Bonin, how it relates to what we saw happen in the results uh, last week now. Well, this is going out next on Tuesday. This will be two weeks ago. Um, but it was, you know, momentous. And we'll get into a bunch of other themes. But first of all, you know, let's get your take. Mac or Mackenzie, which one am I supposed to call you on this? Brad, uh, again, you've already dead named me. So I'll just call you Taylor. Great. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Um, Give me your thoughts on what happened. In the primaries week, generally? Primary, yeah. Well, I think, I mean, we talked about it a little bit on the weekly roundup, but here's, I think, the big takeaway. And you specifically, I want to plug fourth reading in this. You are writing a newsletter uh, as one of our new offerings that will go through uh, kind of in-depth your takes on some text ledge capital uh, events, issues going on at the time. And your first edition talked specifically about Bonin and – Uh, his speakership, as short-lived as it was, and how it relates to what happened in these last primaries. And I really had not thought about it in that way until you brought it up. And I think there's a lot to be said for that. The Texas House is always divided um, politically, even within the Republican Party. Democrats, when you are the minority party, when you're the Democratic Party, um, and you're in a chamber ruled by Republicans, there can tend to be, at least on the surface, a little bit more unity, right? Mm -hmm. You have to band together. You're all fighting against the same man. Republicans, it's so different. Mm -hmm. You're arguing over power. And um, I think this last cycle, we really saw a cycle in which these more moderate, liberal, centrist, however you want to define them, Republicans that have been the ire of Bonin's speakership that were more in line with Speaker Strauss, who was elected by all the Democrats and a small sect of the Republican, uh, you know, the Republicans in the House back in the day, really faced, yes, 12, really faced some ire. Um, Mm -hmm. some electoral ire that they had been um, facing for a while, but succumbed to this time, a lot of them. So that was a big, that was a huge takeaway. And yes, like Bonin's, for those who don't know, we're going to start with this. We're going to go through all the primary. We're going to talk through the details of all sorts of things today, but we are starting with Bonin. Mm -hmm. And what this really relates to and how this all started, we're going to go back to 2019. This was after Speaker Joe Strauss retired and said, I'm not running for another term. He was a five-term Texas House Speaker, I believe the longest serving in Texas history. He was there for a very long time. And he really was um, 
governing in an entirely different way than Republicans on the grassroots level and the mainstream level wanted him to, even mm-hmm. though he was a Republican from San Antonio. And so when Bonin took over as speaker um, and did so with unbelievable support from folks all across the political spectrum, I think there was a lot of hope from Republicans that this would bring in and usher in a new era of Republican governance. Mm-hmm. Whatever that looks like, everyone had different ideas of what that would look like, but that's really what was the the hope yeah. Um, by grassroots activists and Republicans in the House. And, you know, the lieutenant governor and the governor, whoever the else, right? Like, it, everybody. Yeah. It was, you know, we're really waiting to see what was going to happen. <sighs> Fast forward to after the legislative session, which goes from January through May, um, Michael Quinn Sullivan of Empower Texans at the time uh, came forward and said, hey, I had a meeting with the speaker, which was wild to think about MQS meeting with the speaker at this time. MQS is a grassroots activist now associated with Texas Scorecard, part of the Pale Horse apparatus. And back then it was primarily Empower Texans. Um, And he said, hey, I had a meeting with Dennis Bonin. And I, he gave me a list of 10 Republican House members. The Speaker's mm-hmm. Republican. 10 Republican House members he wants me to target and my organization to target in the next cycle. And a those lot. were, I'll list them off for you, uh, Steve Allison, Trent Ashby, Ernest Bales, Travis Clardy, Drew Darby, Kyle Casal, Stan Lambert, Tan Parker, John Rainey, and Phil Stevenson. And if you've paid any attention to the primary side of the cycle, a lot of those names are very familiar. Oh, yes. <laughs> so that's what came out. Eventually, fast forward, a lot of folks were skeptical of MQS saying, oh, yeah, sure, that happened. Um, very quickly, it became apparent that it was. A recording was released. Members in the House started to defect from support uh, of the Speaker. And eventually, it resulted, all of this drama resulted in the Speaker saying he would not run for re-election. And many House members, Republicans um, specifically, uh, you know, revoking their support of the Speaker yeah. after he'd been elected by, you know, I think unanimously. Um, I think it was unanimously. Um, And those 10 Republicans, I think this is important to remember, that Bonin wanted to target, that you listed, were folks who had been um, in that same uh, sect of the party that would align with Strauss, with Democrats, to say, hey, we're going to elect a speaker with a bunch of Democrats and a few Republicans. Bonin was very ardently um, against their membership in the House. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think skeptical, too, as a new speaker of their support for him. Yeah. And so a bit more background. This meeting came on the heels of, um, you know, it has many names. You know, it's been called the Kumbaya session, uh, the yeah. Purple session, derogatorily, um, the Super Bowl session, a session that focused on two pillars above everything else, property tax relief and school finance slash teacher pay raises. And the reason that that was focused on is what happened in the midterms in 2018. The absolute shellacking that Republicans took on a state level, you know, Beto almost winning, almost beating Cruz, but that causing a lot of ripple effects down ballot and having, you know, Democrats taking, flipping three seats in the Senate, I think it was, uh, including two seats in the Senate, two seats in the Senate um, including, you know, Connie Burton's, our bosses. Um, and then also uh, 12 seats, I believe, in the House. Yes. And the you know, Democrats were talking a big game about, you know, a blue wave, we're going to build on this. Um, you know, 2020 is going to be even worse for Republicans. And so the response was, among Republicans in the legislature, was to focus on, quote, bread and butter, kitchen table issues. And that's why they selected property tax relief and uh, the school uh, funding and, and finance issues. And... Throughout the session, um, at least this was my first session in Texas. I was airdropped in here in the middle of it, so it was you know, a lot to get up to speed on. But the impression I got, and let me know what you thought being here the entire time and having the background knowledge you do, um, the the big three were not in the good graces of Michael Quinn Sullivan's sect of the, the right, right, um, especially towards the end when the purple session allegations started coming out, uh, accusations of you know killing conservative bills, things like that. Um, but I don't think it started exactly like that. I think there was a lot, like you said, there was a lot of hope 
among all sides of the party that this was a new Republican era um, with Strauss out of the loop. Yeah. Um, did it? What, what do you think made it devolve to where it was by the end of the session? Well, right off the bat, I do want to say, too, that I think there were, you know, those in leadership in the legislature, like you said, focusing on the bread and butter issues. Their aim was to not alienate voters that they were scared would betray them the next cycle. Whereas, and then you had grassroots folks saying, if we govern conservatively and boldly, then we will uh, kind of shore up our support and also show that we aren't scared. Like that, those were the two approaches. And when the first was taken, there was a lot of disdain from Mm -hmm. the grassroots portion and Republican primary voters, um, that a base of the Republican party was not pleased with that Mm -hmm. at all. And I think, uh, post-session, certainly Bonin saw an opportunity to make sure that he would be able to have some conservative policy wins the next session if he could take these guys out and really lessen the threat to his speakership. Mm -hmm. Um, and keep in mind what was on, um, you know, the, the front porch after the next election, the 2020 election, was redistricting. Yeah. And if Republicans kept their majorities, they would be able to, like what they did, they shored up all kinds of districts that were otherwise, um, you know, in the middle, uh, up for grabs, or they made um, they made red districts more red. And basically, uh, in most of those 12 districts they lost in the House, just said, all right, Democrats, you can have them. We're going to focus on keeping our majority where we're at. Um, so that's that's part of the decision making that they were uh, including in this. Just get to redistricting, get past the 20 election without it being another bloodbath. Yeah. And Republicans will keep what they have basically for the next decade. And I think it's easy for us now in covering Texas politics to forget how precarious it seemed for Republicans at that time, because Mm -hmm. we look at the political makeup of Texas after the Beto wave and everything else, like the losing 12 seats in the House, the two seats in the Senate that Republicans lost. Like, I think it's easy for us to forget, like you're saying, redistricting was on the line. Republicans had just lost so much in the legislature. Um, And so it really was... I think that's when the narrative about um, Texas turning blue really ramped up. Mm -hmm. Media very much jumped on that narrative after the Beto wave when it was the most expensive Senate race in U.S. history up until that point. I don't know if it's been broken since, but it was an unbelievable cycle where Democrats were more invigorated than ever. And I think we've seen some Democrats have success in Texas since because infrastructure was built during that time that had not been there before. So it's easy to look back at that now and be like, oh my gosh, Republicans are fine in Texas. At that point, there was a lot of of fear and scarcity and uh, yeah. question about what would come next. Hindsight's twenty twenty. Always, you know? yeah. Um, so you you covered back in your reporting days. You covered this situation, the, the Bon and tape. Tell us a bit about what that was like day to day. Yeah. As this slow drip of the recording came out. Gosh, it was wild, and it was very much a okay. How many spreadsheets do I need to have made to ensure? <laughs> I know that. Yeah, exactly. Um, just to ensure I know who has said what, because it was always a math game where if Bonin was going to um, lose his support, okay, he's not going to be speaker anymore. And that was really the tipping point we were all waiting for was, okay, at what point have enough members kind of distanced themselves from Bonin where somebody new is going to come in? Mm -hmm. That's what we were watching. And would he not run for re-election? Would there be some sort of caucus move made by the Republicans to remove him? Like there were so many questions. So a lot of it was just keeping track all the time of different members. I cannot tell you how many tweet notifications I had on for like 150 people. (laughs) Um, Well, you know, anything with the speakership, it's all about the math. Yeah. You can you know, have all these political themes coming in that affect it, but at root, it's about the math, whether they can get 76 You numbers. can theorize all day, but yeah. until you have the numbers, it doesn't mean anything. Right. So that's really what it came down to. Um, and that was interesting because they kind of trickled out and like the usual suspects who were critical of Bonn and after the quote unquote Super Bowl session, Purple session, whatever you want to call it, very quickly came out, you know, the Tinder holds, the Biedermans, whoever, very quickly came out and said, hey, we are, um, you know, frustrated by this. We, you know, ask that the speaker step down. And there were different uh, kinds of statements that were put out, like some that were, I'm disappointed. And some that were straight up saying that the speaker should resign. Mm-hmm. Right. So that was a big temperature. Uh, take as well. But that was a lot of it. Um, and of course, people are sending you stuff all the time. Like, hey, don't miss this one. The statements come in. Like, we started to get a little bit of momentum on that front. And it really was toward um, the eve of the recording being released. And after the recording being released, it was like, 
a waterfall of statements and mm-hmm. flurry of activity. And to recap what the, the quid pro quo was on yes. this recording was uh, the speaker to Michael Quinn Sullivan said, hey, here's a list of 10 moderate Republicans that you should target with your um, political apparatus in Empower Texans. And if you do that and we can take some of these guys out, you will use Texas scorecard will be given floor credentials in the house. And that was the, which they had in the Senate deal. and they did not have for right. the house. Right. And so that was the deal that was approached. Um, and basically Bonin said, you know, if I know you're frustrated with this session, but if we can essentially move the center of the GOP caucus rightward, then there will be a lot more leeway to go in terms of the votes on anything yeah. to pa- to just be more conservative generally in what's passed. Yeah. And uh, obviously MQS did not bite, and he ended up doing this slow drip and taking out the speaker. Yeah. And that's so how does this all relate? Like, why are we talking about this now? Yes. <laughs> right. I think this is important to say um, when you listen to that recording of Bonin and MQS, so many of these names of members who uh, had difficulty and are now in runoffs or are entirely defeated post primary are named in this. Clardy is one that immediately comes to mind. Um, Bonin said that Clardy's the ringleader of the opposition. We'd be thrilled to see someone else back in that district. Um, while Tan Parker was too, which is so random. Yeah, uh, it, was, it's not for then, name. but it was, um, well, no, it still was random then because. Yeah, for those who don't know, he then moved on to the Senate a couple of years later and is mm-hmm. a sitting senator now. But regardless, Clardy was one. Um, Bales. I mean, Bales. I mean, essentially, the reason we're talking about this now is that of those 10 members, only three are left in the House. And so, you know, what Bonin was trying to do, you know, take the, the tactics out of it, the, um, the very poor look on doing this behind the scenes in, in a backdoor deal. Which it's easy to forget also how much like distrust this bred among members in the House. And I do think also it's worth saying that Burroughs was in that meeting, Dustin Burroughs, who at the time was the GOP caucus chair. Mm-hmm. He was the other member in the room other than MQS and, and Bonin himself. And Burroughs was actively participating in that conversation and naming some names that Bonin didn't. Mm-hmm. Um, and he has been able to politically recover in mm-hmm. kind of an unbelievable sense. He's calendar. Yeah. Chair, um, He's but one of the top it, lieutenants for top lieutenants, field, yeah. and he um, like that's very notable as well. Yeah. So uh, of these these ten that were named, the three that remain are Ashby, Darby, and Stan Lambert. And so each of those three had a primary this year. Ashby had a lesser one because he did vote for Abbott's school choice plan, uh, or didn't vote to strip it from the omnibus back in November. So he avoided the Governor Abbott pro-school choice onslaught that almost all the rest of these members faced, Uh, you know, some of them succumbing like Allison and Bales, Darby and Lambert managed to outlast it, but it took a lot and it was dicey for them, no doubt. And they had tighter races than probably they've ever had since they first ran for office. Um, The two that... Or Bales was ousted. Bales is no longer in the house. Yeah, did, did I say? I don't. I, I, th- I, I think I said. Anyway. Okay, regardless. Bales w- yes. did lose. He, Allison, But Darby remains. Yes, Darby remains. Uh, then you have Tan Parker, who's now in the Senate, like you said. And then Phil Stevenson was defeated by Stan Kitzman in 22. Yeah. And so basically, and this is the premise of uh, why we're talking about this, what Bonin tried to get then was accomplished or almost fully accomplished here. Uh, after you know five years and millions of dollars from the governor, you know you have the Paxton impeachment playing a role in that as well. Um, although with this list, I think the school choice aspect was a bigger component. You know you had other races like Corona Timesh that uh, was essentially a referendum on the Paxton impeachment. Right. Um, but in, in this regard, I think it was more the Abbott school choice crusade that did it. Um, and then. You mentioned some of the like the slow trickle of members losing support, or dropping support for Bonin. Uh, this is another. This doesn't exactly dovetail with the election, but it does. It did predate what we saw happen. Um, the the five House chairmen who jointly withdrew support for Bonin's speakership that kind of caused 
pushed the snowball off the cliff and ended the, um, the bond and speakership. Uh, that's John Furlo, Dan Huberty, Lyle Larson, Chris Patty, and Fort Price are all gone now. Yeah. They're all out of the legislature. And that may sound like peanuts, may sound like really inside baseball, but they are watching. Um, you know, you can see tw- random tweets when each of them announced their retirement, one out of five, two out of five, three out of five. Then when Fort Price announced his retirement, five out of five. People in the building are watching that. Yeah. They know, they don't forget. Speaker Bonin doesn't forget. Um, and so, you know, after this five years of him kind of being in the wilderness, going into the lobby, he started his own firm. Um, Has certainly been a big part of behind the scenes conversations about some big policy fights in the last few sessions. Absolutely. Yeah. He's still very much in the mix. He's just not the speaker. Um, He's you not know, elected. It's, yeah. It's, it's hard to see him not enjoying seeing the results come in a bit, feeling a bit... Uh, you know, vindicated in terms of what his objective was. Uh, you know, obviously there are a lot of misgivings about the way he went about it, but, um, you know, this is politics, it's a contact sport, and things like this, deals like this, maybe not as quite as significant as this would have been, but stuff like this happens all the time. And I don't think it's, I think it's fair to say it wasn't entirely out of pocket, but um, just the players involved made it so big. Yeah. And the fact that there was a recording of him saying this and then saying a bunch of other things that were... Um, you distasteful. Know, distasteful, absolutely. That blew About Democrats, up. too. Absolutely. Like, there was, a, yeah. there was a lot in the recording about Democrats as well. Yep. So, overall, when I saw these results come in, I was, you know, as the, as the individual results were rolling in, I was like, oh, there's another one. There's another one. That's what made me make the connection between what we just saw happen and the scandal that broke five years ago now. Yeah, absolutely. And it, like you've already said, this is um, a byproduct of an unbelievable primary cycle. I think that's the understatement of the century, but it really was. Um, Preceded by an insane political year. And it isn't that we are not in any way saying that Bonin's list has determined or, or uh, contributed to these results. It's more of a byproduct of yeah. their political, these members' political uh, values and stances being at odds with the momentum of this cycle, mm-hmm. right? This is not because they were on Bonin's list that they now are no, facing no. electoral difficulty. Um, it just happens to coincide with the school choice referendum and Abbott's yeah. crusade against members who were anti-school choice. Like that's, that's what we're talking about here. Mm-hmm. And I think it's also worth mentioning as well that these are members who during the Strauss era, for those who were in office, were very much at the right hand of the speaker. And so for then Bonin to come in and say, these guys are not my people, <laughs> I want you to target them, that's pretty wild. And to give them free reign to do so um, yeah. is, is a pretty wild change up for these members who are so used to being part of leadership. Mm-hmm. Um and certainly not something they were used to. And I think it's easy for folks watching Texas politics at large to forget all the factions. And it's, it's not just the Freedom Caucus or Freedom Caucus, like to the right of the Freedom Caucus members who have disagreements with the larger Republican body. Mm-hmm. The schisms in the Republican Party are wild. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there are many. The factions are very much, we could go into a whole other podcast <laughs> about the factions of just the Republican yeah. Party members in the House. The Senate's so different. Um, politically from the House in that way, not that there aren't schisms there, but mm-hmm. when you have 150 members and 86 Republicans, there's a, and, and it's a power struggle with Democrats you have to take into consideration, it's just a politically complicated body. Mm-hmm. Um, and now with, with these results, arguably, you know, obviously we'll see what happens when we get to the legislature, but they, the center of the GOP caucus has moved right. Mm-hmm. It's absolutely fair to say that. Um, whether that results in effectiveness is a totally different question. Who knows? You know, there are members that won. And what is effectiveness? Yeah, you're right. It's in the eye of the beholder. Um, but there are members who campaign on the idea of, you know, gumming things up for Speaker Phelan should he survive and uh, be the Speaker next session. There's a whole contingent bigger than the Freedom Caucus now. Which is crazy to think about. Yeah. And the Freedom Caucus was born during the Strauss years. 
in, and a lot of these members who were part of the original Freedom Caucus are very much no longer part of the Freedom Caucus and are mm-hmm. lieutenants of the Speaker now. They've been yeah. at least politically satisfied with the direction of the House or they've been in office long enough for their perspectives to change regardless. One of those two things has happened. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of them stepped outside of the Freedom Caucus. Other members, a small handful, kind of said, hey, I'm not going to be part of the Freedom Caucus anymore because it's not conservative enough. It's not serving. They're not bomb-throwing enough. Yeah. Right. Like they did under um, Strauss. Yeah. Exactly. So that's also a big part of it. But we should probably then just move on to the next part here, yeah. talking about those members and what this could mean for next session. After the primary, we saw a lot of members, like you said, who campaigned on saying, I'm willing to uh, go up against the speaker on a variety of different issues or even run for speaker some mm-hmm. of them have now won and will be in the house this next session yeah I, mean, I think when I tallied it up on uh, on Tuesday night or Wednesday morning after the election it was uh, they had reached 10 members that the exact number that you need at least under the rules right now to challenge the ruling of the chair and when I mentioned you know, members campaigning on the idea of gumming things up that's what I mean, being there to object to certain rulings. Now, it's also interesting that that's a House rule. It can be amended. It can be raised fairly easily with a majority. And so that's something to watch next session when we get to the rules fight, which is going to have a lot of different themes. Which happens in the first few days of session. Yeah. It's like the first order of business on the floor yep. members take up. Uh, do they, other than electing the speaker, of course, yes, but yes. Um, do they do they raise that threshold to 25? Whatever number eclipses this new contingent. Which is nothing new to see no. leadership try and make the rules no. uh, benefit them or kind of circumvent an issue they see within the body that they're leading, right? Mm-hmm. That's not, that's nothing new to see a rules fight like that happen. Yeah. Um, so they have, they have 10 right now. That's, uh, I believe, the... Freedom Caucus itself has eight-ish, I think. Um, most of them are, are new members, freshmen currently. Uh, they may get some more. Depends on what happens in these elections uh, and in which freshman members they decide to bring in. But I think at, at the beginning of the 21 session, the Freedom Caucus had like 13, roughly. A lot more, significantly more. Yeah. How many do they have now? Do we need, let me look this up. I thought it was like eight, but that was just offhand last time I looked at this. Yeah. Um, so you'll have that dynamic of the old Freedom Caucus that is not part of the State Freedom Caucus network that gets a lot of grief because of that. And then the this new group that they may not go as far as, you know, taking the name Freedom Caucus, but they're going to try and position themselves as the actual Freedom Caucus. And so... Uh, it's it's like the Monty Python bit about uh, <laughs> the People's Front of Judea and the Judean People's Front. Oh, I totally get um, this reference. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, it's just political jockeying. Yeah. And there's disagreements, like you said, among all the factions. It's In the House, it's herding cats, which was one of the names I was considering for my newsletter, but that got <laughs> vetoed. Um, Wait, who? Did I veto it? I think you did, yeah. I don't remember Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Anyway, so we were going to call this podcast Not Jermaine, or at least that was the vote in our Slack, and then that got rejected by certain individuals mm. with unchecked be? power Unche- in, this, <laughs> in this here company. Daniel kept saying this isn't uh, by democracy, by method of democracy. This has been determined. The yeah. name has been determined, and yeah. then it was vetoed. It was. It was. Like Governor Abbott this past... <laughs> <laughs> Summer. <laughs> <laughs> also, there are eight members of the Freedom Caucus. Eight me- okay, yeah, I was right. Yeah, yeah. I was right. At least right now. That's not, like- not including outgoing member Schaefer. Yeah. 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 So that's going to be an interesting dynamic to watch. Then obviously you throw in um, the speakership and the reason that things like Democratic chairs are even a factor in this because – um, well, there's two. There's the speakership. Uh, to prevent something like what got Strauss into power was, you know, 12 Republicans siphoning off with all the Democrats. The speaker, the last two speakers, Phelan and Bonin, avoided that by getting support from Democrats that then basically eliminated the possibility of this group of 12 going off with the Democratic caucus. 
Um, and then you have the uh, the other reason that Dem chairs is, is really a thing. Republicans have 86 seats in the House. And depending on what happens in November, which there are a couple pickup opportunities, HD 80 is one. I think they're pretty optimistic, bullish on that. Uh, and then HG70 in Collin County yeah, is, is potential, depending on you know how much of a of a campaign Steve Kennard, the the Republican nominee, can mount up there. Yeah. So there are pickup opportunities, but they're they're not getting close to 100. It's just not happening. And so because of that, to pass the budget, you need and to amend the Constitution, you got to hit 100. So you need Democrats to play ball, at least some. Right. So those are the two prevailing factors. You know, there's a lot of talk about tradition in the House of nominating Democrats as chairs. And, you know, that's that's an easy way out of describing this. But the real reason is the math. Yes. And no matter what you do, no matter how much people, you know, stomp their feet and, and throw fits about it, um, the math is the math. It's going to remain that way. And... Uh, Oddly enough, though, related to our bonding conversation, um, taking these seven of these ten members out now, that reduces the number of Republicans that, at least presumably at the moment, would be willing to si- to align with Democrats and nominate their own speaker. So um, maybe you know this group of new challengers that got in uh, unintentionally. I mean, they campaigned on opposing Democratic chairs, but. Maybe they unintentionally eliminated that, at least as a significant portion of the decision-making process. I don't know. But. Which is, is like, in, to your point about the House, the Senate is led by Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, who's elected by Texans. Yes. Not just one district. And not then elected by his fellow senators. He's not a senator. He's the Lieutenant Governor. And he's elected on a statewide basis. So that's part of where the difference between the Senate and the House is as well, right? Where you have to balance just as in other chambers across the country and in D.C. as well, a speaker is chosen by their colleagues, their fellow mm-hmm. members. And they represent a district just like the other members of that chamber. They choose from among themselves. Mm-hmm. It makes it very politically difficult. And then you add how much centralization of power the lieutenant uh, the current lieutenant governor dan patrick has which speaking done. of rules changes yeah i mean the senate's had a lot my, of that my first memory in the legislature when i f- moved here in 19 was not the bonin thing it was dan patrick threatening the nuclear option and reducing the supermajority level and then kel seliger standing up giving his um basically filibuster where eventually he relented yeah. but you know that was the first memory i have of this legislature and that's a very important uh, rules change and the reason he was able to do that the reason he did it in the first place was because of the losses suffered in the chamber of those two seats you said and without reducing that that would limit what it would give democrats more power in affecting what they can actually consider on the floor and so he basically blew up the supermajority and lowered it. Yeah. And then I think he lowered it again in 21. But that's not really something, the numbers aren't there to do that in the House. They just aren't. And that is another massive difference between the House and the Senate. Absolutely. So you found a tweet this week that was particularly interesting, considering all of these new members joining the House, that contingency of Republicans uh, gaining more uh, allies kind of tell us about what what this hypothesis is so it it um dovetails also with the democratic chair issue but it's an idea i hadn't heard so far and maybe we see that uh coming up in the next session but it's by aaron harris and uh, an gop activist he's consultant. consultant um i think he at one point was chief for don buckingham in the senate before that it was um lance good but I, i'm thinking of the the activist group, the election. Oh, uh, direct action. Direct Texas. action, Texas. Yeah. So he's in and around text ledge circles constantly, but he had this thread where he discussed um, uh, bills being essentially buried in a committee that is chaired by a Democrat, and this discharge petition rule would um, would require a bill to be moved in committee that it hasn't been assigned to within, you can pick your time period, he says 72 hours here, if a majority of 
the body sign on to the bill, I assume as co-author or uh, co-sponsor. And so if that happens, it would be required that this bill move. Um, I'm not sure how much a bill with that much support actually does get stopped in committee. I'm sure it's happened. It happens quite more often than you think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the at least bill enough. The bathroom would be a big one that I remember yeah. immediately, like the 85th session. Yeah. yeah. Enough for them to think of this rule change. And that would be an interesting, uh, speaking of rules fight, you know, that would be, other than just outright banning Democratic chairs, that would be kind of a, a half measure that if you can't, if the numbers aren't there to ban Dem chairs, that um, you could kind of accomplish the same thing or at least close to it. I'm not sure if the, the, you know, the caucus is going to really push for this, but I think it is uh, creative. And he said that Briscoe Kane, out a Republican from Deer Park, has proposed this in previous sessions. But who knows if it gets movement. Yeah. yeah. But that would be an interesting take or an interesting um, deviation from the Democratic chair's argument that could potentially assuage some of those concerns from Republicans. And when we see the rules come out, there is a proposed set of changes by the author. I think last time it was Hunter, uh, but I'm not sure who that's going to be this time. But they basically lay out proposed changes. And then members have a day or so to look at it, evaluate. Then on the floor, they propose their amendments. So, you know, if uh, whoever the next speaker is, if, if it's still Dave Thielen and he wants to try and avoid the Democratic chair vote, this could be, you know, a half measure of compromise that they slide into the leadership blessed version of the House Rules yeah. session. So, who knows? It's always wild. I'm curious to see how the House Rules will um, be ferried through the process this year after Smithy and impeachment and everything else. Well, last time the Democratic chair issue, that, that was a, a, a clever maneuver, I'd say. I mean, they put a, a provision in when everyone was none the wiser expecting this vote on the ban or the half ban of Democratic chair appointments. And they basically said, they put this provision in that said, you can't use House resources for political purposes. Uh, very, that's not very well defined. That's which kind was of the point. point. Yeah. And so point of order was brought by, I think, Charlie Guerin, at which point the parliamentarians and the speaker approved the, the point of order and killed the used that to kill the Democratic chair ban uh, amendments. Mm-hmm. And it worked. So they avoided this vote that if they, they probably would have passed. I mean... Maybe not, right? but it at least would have been close, and they avoided it. Yeah. And that caused a lot of this uproar that led into the primary. Absolutely. Well, speaking of the primary then, I mean, the biggest race anybody was watching in the state, I think it's fair to say, was in House District 21, Mm -hmm. Speaker Phelan. Speaking of the speaker, his district, challenged by David Covey, who was endorsed by Trump, had major support from Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, uh, surprising and unsurprising altogether entirely, both... um, and he's now in a runoff. It was a three-person race. Alicia Davis was the third candidate. And now we're seeing a lot of conversations behind the scenes among Democrats, among Republicans. We'll talk about both, about what this could mean for the House this coming session. So you uh, tweeted out this week a memo or an email from Democrat members um, kind of talking about some behind-the-scenes speaker conversations and a call that they had. What do we know about that call? So we know what happened on Monday morning. So if this is going out on Tuesday, the previous Monday. uh, Yeah. And uh, caucus chair Trey Martinez-Fisher organized it right after the, uh, reset it right after the primary results came in. And the purpose was to talk about their path forward going into the next session in the general election also. So it wasn't all just session talk and speaker talk. I don't know any, everything that was said, but the general themes were, how do we strategize? How do we organize? Um, you know, I'm sure discussion about the speaker came up, whether it's feeling explicitly or if it's, um, you know, potential alternatives if he, some, if he somehow loses, which is very much coin flip right now. I don't, I don't know how that's going to turn out. But 
um, you know, Democrats, they're game planning uh, how they're going to play their cards because they do have limited cards in their hand. They don't have a majority. But there are things that they they can't avoid, that Republicans can't avoid, take the quorum bus. You know, that's a, a last that seems measure. seems so long ago. Right? Yeah. And this last four years has been <laughs> insane. But that's something Republicans always have to contend with because they don't have a supermajority. Yeah. How much does that require? Does that get the Democrat as a caucus, Democrats as a caucus into the room as you know, with a seat at the table when picking a speaker, right? Yeah. Probably gives them a significant amount, at least related to compared with their minority status in the makeup of the house. So there was that. I don't I don't know exactly everything that was said on the call, but the email laid out a whole bunch. You can see it on my Twitter, uh, a whole bunch of themes. They see an opportunity, yeah. basically, whether that's in the general election, which I'm not sure what those pickup opportunities would be. Maybe, a maybe what was it 118 in Bear County with John Lujan? It's a, a pretty dead even seat. Um, but that's just, you know, one or two seats we're talking. The bigger thing is nothing that can really comes. tilt the needle at yeah. all. Yeah. And the, why is this notable, right? Like, why is it notable that we have members of the House currently talking about how to strategize for a speaker fight? It's because they smell blood in the water, mm -hmm. right? Feeling as a sitting speaker, not outright winning despite having a, you know, a ton of opposition to his candidacy this cycle. Regardless, a sitting speaker being forced into a runoff is wild. Yeah. And the first time in decades that this has happened. Um, and I believe we talked about it. The last time this happened was like in 72. Rayford Price, he was the only speaker, for, though, for a few months at that point. He lost to, he was a conservative Democrat. He was pushed to a runoff after redistricting. So there's another difference between Phelan's case and this case. Uh, it was after redistricting, so the, the district itself was substantially different from the one he'd been running in. And then another sitting member, um, another sitting member moved into the district, this new one, to run against him and defeated him in a, yeah. in a runoff that went to a recount. So entirely different circumstances, but regardless... I wouldn't say entirely you, different, but you know, very substantially different. different. Yes. Um, and I think really shows how rare this is, right? Yeah. This is wild. And so to have members behind the scenes, even Democrats who at times have been uh, discontented with Phelan and at other times have been pleased with his speakership, circling the wagons, and we had Republicans doing so even before primary day, mm -hmm. which I think says even more about the situation the speaker finds himself in. If you have Republican members saying, hey, we need to start having these conversations, and if Phelan goes down, hey, maybe I'm willing to run for speaker. Or hey, would you be willing to run for speaker? That's huge. Mm -hmm. And the speaker no doubt knows about those conversations happening behind the scenes. Certainly. Certainly. And there are also you know, conversations happening about Phelan surviving the election and winning the the speakership again. Like, it's all up in the air. Yeah. Who knows? Because other members have said, hey, he'll win the runoff. He'll be fine. He'll be speaker again next session. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, in the heat of the moment following a primary, everyone to the your smelling blood in the water um, example, it, uh, emotions get heated. Yeah. And people think that this that X thing because Y didn't happen is going to happen. It may end up happening. It may not. We may have feeling a speaker next session. He may not even be a member. It's too early. Who knows at yes. This moment. But it is being discussed. Absolutely. Breaking news from the heart of the Lone Star State. Exclusively for listeners of the Smoke Filled Room podcast, you can now use the coupon code Smoke Filled Room, one word, all caps, to save 10% on any hat or shirt on the Texan store by visiting store.thetexan.news. Get a Come and Take It t shirt featuring the iconic Gonzalez flag, a Remember the Alamo hat, and more. Once again, get 10% off any hat or shirt by visiting store.thetexan.news and using the coupon code SMOKEFILLEDROOM. Now back to your regular scheduled programming. And we're back after a break because the camera, the expensive <laughs> camera we've decided to purchase to do these, th these kinds of things, filming these podcasts, overheated. Mm. That's what you get with South Korean 
handwork. I assume that's where it was made. I don't know. Maybe it wasn't. Are we keeping this in? Absolutely. Okay. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> then there you go. I don't know where Canon. Oh, it's Sony. Yeah, it is South Korean. Okay. We do not have Canon. We have Sony Bradley. My, my bad. Gosh. My bad. Sheesh. Um, my Atlantis. Yeah, I was, I was not a, a PlayStation kid. I was an Xbox kid, so it just goes over my Do you head. have a Nintendo DS? Did we talk about this? Yeah, I did. I had a Nintendo DS Lite. It was pink. Mm. I was very off tangent, but my friends and I were at the bar the other day, and we were naming. Shocker. We were guessing, yeah, right, guessing the most uh, sold video games of all time. And guess what was, I think it was around 15 or 20? 15, like ranked 15th or 20th? Yeah, in all time sales. Late Star Wars, uh, Lego Star Wars. No. Nintendogs. Yep. We were floored by that. Nintendogs was such a good game. Well, think of how many Nintendogs are starving right I now. I was just about, and dirty, and, and unbathed. Yeah. And frankly dead, probably. Probably. Yeah. And on that note, we'll go back to our <laughs> topic. <laughs> <laughs> the speakership in Texas politics following this primary. <laughs> oh, brother. Well, we stopped kind of talking about the um, what members are saying, the general numbers. Um, Which we kind of, like, talked about vaguely. But let's say that the speakership here in the House does change this next session, that it, there's a shakeup. How many Republicans, like give us a number, would need to side with Democrats in order to elect a speaker if the makeup remained what it is now? If it remains the same, I think it's 12. Okay. 86 members. I think I'm doing the math correctly on that. I think you're I was never great, great at math in, in school, which is why I could never be in the legislature. I, I can't count. I just can't. Um, but I think it's But you have a lot of spreadsheets that help you. That I do. Yeah. That I do. Uh, now, that, that is subject to change, obviously, with... Uh, you know, whatever happens in November, if Republicans take a seat or two, or if Democrats take a seat or two, yeah, who knows? But but about a dozen, I think it's around a dozen, which is I think the same amount that it is the same amount that Strauss yeah uh, secured his speakership with. So and if trends continue to be what they have been for midterms, presidential cycles, this should be a pretty good cycle for Republicans with the Democrat in the White House. Yeah. Texas being what it is. We'll have to see. The Trump and Biden yeah. aspect is a little bit. Do you think it's closer to 2020 or 2016? Well. In terms of the overarching environment. Yeah. Politically. I don't think it's like either. I really don't. Wow, what a cop out. No, I don't. I think it's entirely different. What would you say? I don't have an answer. Yeah, <laughs> I, <was hoping> <laughs> I don't think it's like either. I think it's so different. And I think the candidates or who appear to be the candidates at this point, who are guaranteed to be the candidates at this point. Yeah. I think it's a very, um, it'll just be very interesting to see how turnout is specifically. Yeah. Turnout, turnout, turnout. But really, I, I'm fascinated to see. We have two very, very old candidates with very, um, who have weathered horrible approval ratings during the time that they were both in office, both have been in office. Mm -hmm. It's just a very weird, it's a very weird cycle. Well, when you put it like that, I suppose you're right. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I, overall, though, I don't think this is going to be a, a 2018 cycle. You know, the, there's no Beto mania on the ballot. Ted Cruz is back on the ballot. Colin and Allred is certainly a formidable yeah. candidate. I mean, they're taking him seriously. The attack has already out there. So, uh, you know, if he wasn't worth hitting, they wouldn't be hitting him. But um, he's been fundraising quite well, but not like Beto did. And he Which was astronomical, oh, yeah, to be like, fair. I, it would be unfair, I think, as a Democrat to ask Allred to raise that kind of money. It's just not doable. And you know that was a unique cycle where Republican incumbent in the White House, the midterm right after he was elected, very unpopular. Um, among independents and obviously Democrats, right? Uh, but that was just kind of like a perfect storm that led to this blue wave that led to you know, a lot of pickups that Democrats still have today in, in both chambers, um, especially the House. I think that uh, SD10 is now back to Republican held. Yeah. But yeah, it's 
I guess you're right. It's not not the same. It's not the same. <laughs> yeah. Um, but on that note, let's also talk about um, dynamics with Patrick and Phelan. I think this is a really big deal. Like we mentioned earlier, Phelan has certainly drawn the ire of the lieutenant governor. The lieutenant governor has been very vocally um, aggressive toward the speaker, and the speaker certainly has you know, fired right back. So it's I mean, lieutenant good. governor just called on him to drop out of the race. Oh, I didn't even know that. Yeah, because um, Alicia Davis, a third place finisher in the race, endorsed Covey, which oh. was not surprising. No, that's and that's typically how it works. If yeah. you have an incumbent who's facing formidable challengers, if there's more than one, the other one usually endorses yeah. the other challenger that remains. So that's pretty normal. Also, he's not going to drop out. It's just the speaker of the house. And but still, that's the that's the rhetoric that we're working with this cycle. And it really started with property taxes, bled into impeachment. There's been a lot, even throughout session, things really got heated. Mm-hmm. So we were not surprised to see the lieutenant governor really go after the speaker vocally in these ways. It ramped up over time. Um, he's not. He stopped short of blatantly endorsing the speaker, but has run ads. Against the speaker. Excuse me, yes, against the speaker, but has run ads against the speaker as paid for all sorts of things in the district to support Covey. So, but then he s- did blatantly endorse Covey. Oh yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes, so, yes. So like it went from yes him, the lieutenant governor saying, "I might have some things to say, but I'm not going to get involved in house races." And this is December. Yeah. Right after the fourth special the session, big ended. press conference. Yeah. yeah. Um, and just you know, in that press conference, he railed against Phelan for all the number of reasons that he you know frequently cites. But he said, I'm not going to get involved in house races. I just might have something to say. Right. Well, that hasn't held true. Yeah. He has jumped headlong into multiple races, including the speakers and especially the speakers. Which tradition in the legislature usually dictates that the leader of a given chamber does not dip their toes much into races affecting the other chamber. Right. So the speaker doesn't usually come forward and endorse um, or campaign against senators, vice versa for the lieutenant governor in house races. It's not typical. That's not been the case at all this cycle. Mm-hmm. Uh, not, that, not that the speaker has gotten involved in any Senate races, but the lieutenant governor certainly has gotten involved in a lot of House races. But what if Phelan wins? Like, what if Phelan returns to the House after Patrick, who has very vocally campaigned against Phelan, um, given money, campaigned against uh, incumbents that he thinks are anti-school choice like Abbott, right? Like all these things. And impeachment is a whole other factor in this Mm -hmm. that isn't talked about as much, but it is a huge factor Mm -hmm. in this fight. What happens? What's the dynamic between Patrick and Phelan? How do they they govern? I think nothing happens next session. You know, and I think that that's generally generally the, the feeling in the building should, you know, the... It's not expected right now as the outcome among many people, but it could be in an odd way, like the Occam's razor explanation, the simplest explanation holds true. If Phelan keeps the seat, holds the speakership. If that does happen, I mean, the, the tension, the, the feud, the vitriol between these two is so large that um, I, we'd have even more gridlock which someone argues a great thing, you know. Others, um, probably everyone on the uh, Republican side, with you know majority in both chambers, would argue it's not at the moment. But I don't see much happening, much of any significance, if both of them are back. And obviously, Patrick will be back. Uh, feeling if he's back, you know, what incentive, especially after the lieutenant governor got involved in his race, he's. Dan Patrick is putting his cards on the table. He is put it going all in to get feeling out. And if it doesn't work, what incentive does the speaker have to work with Patrick? Right. I mean, these are human beings. Yes. Who have grudges. Yes. And these are two of the grudgiest individuals, <laughs> at least between each other, the in the legislature. Yes. And so, you know, the lieutenant governor said my... My good faith with Phelan is broken last session. Well, you know, the lieutenant governor said he wasn't going to endorse in the in any race, let alone the... So not only going after the speaker, he's going after his majority, too. I mean, I'm sure the speaker would say he's much more tight-lipped, but I'm sure he'd say the same thing. Yeah. So not a lot I don't think is going to happen. 
the lieutenant governor at the very beginning of the legislative session sat down with us at our event and talked about how he was not willing to say anything really negative about the speaker going into the session and was like, hey, hands off. Let's let the session speak for itself. Let's see where the House ends up politically, what legislation they pass, what policy priorities they lay out. And then we'll have a discussion about how my relationship with the speaker is, basically. And this was on the heels of the previous session where constitutional carry repricing were the two big issues. That the two hand grenades thrown across the rotunda the, to yes, each other. Absolutely. Um, it was not nearly as uh, loud or vocally aggressive toward each other as they are this this last session. Um, but, you know, the lieutenant governor's rhetoric was, hey, I'm going to wait and see how things go before mm -hmm. I make any sort of um, statement on our relationship. And I thought also it was interesting at that event, he acknowledged like the, the differences, the realities of a speakership versus yes. his position that places him in a much stronger position because he's popularly elected, you know, provided you win, of right. course, right? But And the Senate had, at the time, one Democratic chair. Mm -hmm. The Senate did not draw the ire of grassroots conservatives in the same way the house did and lieutenant governor Dan patrick basically was like hey this is john whitmire he's the dean of the senate he's been here for he pulled the decades. tradition card yes and um he's chair of the criminal justice committee in the senate which his argument also was you don't see big red meat policy fights happening in that committee mm -hmm. right like that happens in state affairs that happens in other committees so that was the argument um and a lot of folks in the grassroots circles don't really have they have not had that much of a problem with that now whitmire of course is now outside of the senate he's mayor of houston we'll now see what happens um but it will be interesting yeah the dean is right oh the chair of the committee i don't know i think it's pete flores sounds right maybe wrong about that but um but then impeachment happened um the lieutenant governor was very quiet about the entire impeachment proceeding come May, as it was very quickly becoming an issue the Senate would have to address. Um, he was very quiet about it until after the trial in the Senate happened and he came forward and made a very impassioned, fiery speech about the um, haste and uh, irresponsibility of the House in sending impeachment, the impeachment of Attorney General Ken Paxton over to the Senate for trial, lambasting the speaker. Um, at the crux of his speech. so And they'd already had it out over the summer over property taxes. Yes. The, I but mean, that was a knockdown, drag out fight, and this took it up another level. And impeachment was not discussed at those press conferences. The lieutenant governor and the senators, very tight lipped. Gag order. They took it seriously. They didn't say anything. Who knows what was happening behind the scenes? But publicly, quiet. Mm -hmm. As soon as it was over, game on. Mm -hmm. It happened very, very quickly. So I don't know. I don't know what happens. I think voters have a very. Um, forgiving attention span when it comes to different issues. You've seen that with Governor Abbott and how he's regarded by grassroots folks these days over the border, over school choice, whatever that is. I also am very curious about school choice, <laughs> right? If we have an entirely new slate of House members who are very pro-school choice coming into the House, Phelan has historically given a lot of ground to folks on those kind of red meat issues when there's enough support behind them. Um, yeah, and school choice, he basically said, I'm keeping my hands off it. Yeah. You guys deal figure with it, it figure it out. Yeah. So what would that mean if the makeup of the House is different this, this session, right? And that's an issue the lieutenant governor has lambasted the House over, so mm. there would be less political ambition on the speaker's part, perhaps, to pass something like that. But his members might want it more than they did last cycle. That would be a very interesting dynamic. Yeah. And you know the governor is going to go hell for leather over that because that's his. I mean, the governor has kept his hands out of the speaker's race. Yep. And you know, talk about putting all your cards on the table. Abbott did that with these primaries. Yeah. Um, you know, if he hadn't flipped the seats that he did, and by the way, I think they're like two seats away from a majority support for, uh, in terms of the vote that happened in for to strip the ESAs. So who knows what the then version of this school choice education omnibus whatever is at the time at next session that may sway things numbers a bit but in terms of the vote we had in november i think the governor is two seats away from having majority and we have a bunch of runoffs where we could we yield two seats pretty but pretty also easily. there were members who you know were kind of on the fence they weren't like bales or clardy or uh darby who said Heck no, I'm not, in, under no circumstance am I voting for this. Yeah.
There were members that... Rogers. Uh, Rogers was another one like yeah. that. Members that were on the fence that ultimately um, came down against it or for stripping the, the provision, but that were very much part of the negotiations and... Um, in know, the discussion. In discussion. Open to it in some way. Yeah. Right? So m- maybe they have it right now. It's certainly possible. Probably depends on the the format of whatever we see. But, but it's um, easy to f- forget how dynamic the school choice vote could be depending on the proposal <laughs> and what exactly is on the table, mm-hmm. what it's tied to, what the rhetoric is at the time, how school funding's factored into that whole discussion. Teacher pay. Teacher pay. So it's a very dynamic situation in which we did not see any Democrats cross over the line last session and vote in favor of school choice proposals. I think there's a world in which a couple would. Mm -hmm. Um, It depends on what kind of guardrails and whatnot they put on it. If there are any, I don't know. Yeah. What kind of bracketing is involved. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously, you know, Abbott's spiking the football on the success of this crusade. Okay, Brad, when you say spiking the football, what does that even mean? You know, Gronk, when he scores a touchdown. Oh, it's like a celebr- it's like yes. a celebration. Yes. Okay. Wow. Got it. I didn't think I'd have to explain something so simple. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> there's our there's our feuding for the the, the episode. <laughs> We've been so nice to each yeah, other. Right. <laughs> Can we just talk about it? <laughs> um, Ed is obviously, you know, he he says his advisors himself even are saying, you know, the job's not done. We still have these runoffs to go, but they're feeling very good, and. What they did worked. Now, the counter argument is that in especially some of these races, like HG-121 in Bear County, the emphasis was not on school choice or parental empowerment. However, it's packaged by the governor and those supporting it. The messaging came on border security. Now, all's fair in politics, right? Like, Mark LaHood ended up winning by quite a landslide. Yeah. Defeated Steve Allison. That's really what matters. Yes. Um, that's the outcome. But, you know, there are there is a contention that, well, the voters, maybe they wouldn't say it as brashly, but were fooled in terms of what this guy, what LaHood was about. Um, you know, I don't know if that would hold up to scrutiny, but, like, you know, the messaging was heavily border security because that's when you look at all the polling, that's the top issue. Yeah. And it became a race of who can out border security the other one. <laughs> and LaHood won. Yeah. Um, you know, Abbott and all, and like the Club for Growth money that came in and the AFC Victory Fund and all that absolutely played a role. Probably a pretty big one, I'd say. Uh, just the sheer amount of money that came into some of these races is astronomical. But, um, you know, that's the contention from, I would say, that those on the losing side of this fight at least for now, this primary fight. Who knows where they end up in the policy fight to come. But then, the, you know, they have the, the counter argument that a lot of these anti-voucher members justified their vote saying, oh, it'd cre- it uh, create vouchers you paid for by public dollars for illegal immigrants. That was the big messaging we saw in the yeah. last month particularly. Yeah, and, you know, it's kind of a, a clever end around of the issue, turning it into a border security issue. And, um, you know, it's probably true because there was a uh, court ruling in the 70s that said Texas public schools had to pay for education for illegal immigrants. You couldn't say, no, we're not paying for this. So, yeah, if you pass a voucher system, uh, an education savings account system, you would have to open that up. In eligibility or address for it illegal immigrants, yeah, or address it legislatively. Although that may not stand up to constitutional scrutiny because of this previous ruling, who knows? But regardless, that was not the message that was sold when the vote happened. There was nothing about border security or illegal immigrants receiving funding that I recall during that marathon debate on the floor. As usual, politics, you know, it's gonna, they're going to pick and choose their little kernels of truth that they <laughs> then extrapolate. To make their message. And they look at polling. Absolutely. They look at their little polls. They decide what's important. Both sides do it. Both sides do. Yeah. 100%. And that's where I think the dynamic between Patrick and Phelan will be particularly fascinating. It will be really, really fascinating. And Abbott putting the foot on the gas for that will be huge. Yeah. We talked so much leading up to the primary about, okay, Paxton, Abbott, 
Paxton, school choice, impeachment, how does that all fit in together? And those were the two big, I would say, motivators, maybe not the most um, uh, like marketed or sold points in the primary. I think impeachment kind of took a back seat in that way on mailers, mm -hmm. ads, et cetera. Still certainly part of the discussion, but not in the way school choice and the border were particularly. But the motivators for candidates entering races, school choice and impeachment. Mm -hmm. And school choice is where the money was. It's where a lot of there the was money no money, was. almost no money from impeachment, um, at least not compared to you know what we saw come come in from AFC and Club for Growth and Abbott. Yeah, absolutely. But how? I mean, we talked about this um, leading up to the primaries. Okay, which one's going to be more important to voters? How effective, when you look back at the attorney general's involvement in these races, and he was very quick to endorse candidates. He was at the you know front lines of these primaries very quickly, mm -hmm. either rallying, issuing endorsements, etc. Um, he was not as much of a financial contributor to campaigns, and I think in large part that has to do with the legal fees um, post impeachment. Their millions. He also and just doesn't have dollars. as much money as Abbott does. Hundred yeah. percent. Um, so there were a lot of factors in that part of it. But how effective do you think Paxton, his his involvement, the Trump factor? Because I think Trump and Paxton together, um, a lot of the support for those two men mirrors, like they mirror each other. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of folks who are very vocally supportive of Paxton are very vocally supportive of Trump. Um, how, to walk me through your perspective on the Paxton of it all. Well, if you put them up head to head, Abbott versus Paxton, Paxton school choice, presumably school choice versus impeachment. Abbott won a lot. Now Abbott endorsed more incumbents. Um, Abbott actually put money behind his candidates. I don't think that's a knock against Abbott um, in terms of his effectiveness in this race. It's in this just a primary. factor. It's part it's of the absolutely. deal. Absolutely. Uh, Paxton had a, a wildly worse uh, record against Abbott. Now. I don't think he cares. In the races in which Paxton endorsed somebody that Abbott didn't and vice versa. Right. right? right. That's what we're talking about here. Right. Not just they endorsed all opposing of, candidates. Not yes. all of Paxton's endorsements, not all right. of Abbott's endorsements, just the ones in which they were opposed. And they were on the same side and a lot. A, a number, yeah. yeah. I, I don't know how many, but a decent amount. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um but the uh I think Paxton will not care about his that head to head record because he notched two very big wins, especially three if you count put the speaker getting pushed to a runoff, which was a whole amalgamation of yes. issues. That wasn't just Paxson, but he was absolutely a part of that. Um, the uh, the Mitch Little, Crown and Timish race, I think that's one that Paxton absolutely um, puts a feather in his cap on. Mitch Little being part of his legal team throughout yeah. the Senate impeachment trial, yep. a very notable one at that, the yep. forefront of a lot of the big moments of the trial. And he um that actually was also that was among the head to head that was one of his victories because Abbott back to mesh who had voted not to strip ESAs and voted with him on that on the school choice issue which was Abbott's remember. lone issue. right that was yeah. his only issue. which Paxton's I think was kind of impeachment too like his yeah I remember he said on a podcast when asked about this dynamic Abbott's more focused on one issue I'm focused on a broader set of issues which He's focused on impeachment and retribution for it. Um, I mean, that's just what it is. I mean, he's going on a re revenge tour. Even though he bristles at the term, that's what it was. And uh, he notched very big wins on that with the speaker and the HG65 race. But then uh, he might even argue that the biggest victory was sweeping the Court of Criminal Appeals races. And unbelievable that that was one of the cornerstone, the cornerstones of the whole primary yeah. were court of appeals races. Yeah. And two of the three were not close at all. No. Now, I, I'd argue, especially on something like that, where nobody knows what that is. They, I mean, most of them don't even know. Most voters probably have a vague idea of what the Texas Supreme Court is. But how does it relate to the court of criminal appeals, which is just as powerful, yeah. but on criminal issues? Uh, it's just not some, not an issue that... Um, that penetrates very well in, in terms of you know, voters' understanding, consciousness, um, and interest, frankly. But Trump endorsements came in for that, and I think those were huge. And it flipped the—it's, I'm sure, flipped the script on the Michelle Slaughter race. That was a lot closer. She was the one that wrote the Stevens opinion 
that has drawn a lot of criticism from Paxton and his allies over it stripping his ability to prosecute election fraud, illegal voting, I think. Um, and so that was, of those three wins, Paxton is going to be very happy with how he performed. Mm -hmm. And rightfully so, I'd say, you know, those are massive wins for him from a purely political yeah. standpoint, you know, like, um, I don't see him really, uh, you know, be disappo being disappointed about what happened. And he certainly didn't sound like it the next morning on Mark Davis's radio show. Totally. And those members that we were talking about earlier, the, the 10 or so that are the non freedom, freedom caucus, <laughs> like however you wanted to find those members, they're all very supportive of Paxton. Yep. And a lot of members were added to that contingency. Mm -hmm. So they're able to challenge the ruling of the chair, et cetera, et cetera, based on whatever the rules are decided this session. But according to the rules now of the house, they could wield more significant power if they band together and continue to be united in the way that they've said they want to be mm -hmm. during the session. And those are all very uh, vocal Ken Paxton allies. Oh, yeah. In addition to, I think they're all for school choice as well. So, like, what you got, that's where it was so interesting. Like, Abbott, Paxton, Patrick have all aligned in some ways and not in others mm -hmm. in these primaries. And Abbott has been very. Um, intentional in keeping his hands out of the speaker's race. He's been very intentional in endorsing folks based on the school choice issue alone. Mm -hmm. Last cycle, even when he started to speak very freely about his intention to pass school choice somehow in Texas, received a lot of flack for endorsing members who were not pro-school choice like Rogers. This cycle, that was not the case at all. It was very consistent in how he went about his endorsements. Yep. And he's been very intentional in not engaging in some of this Paxton, Phelan, you know, uh, drama yeah. that's been going on. Now, they're big issues, so drama might minimize <laughs> how big of a deal this is politically, but pa but Abbott has very um, intentionally kept his hands out of it. And one reason that Abbott backed all these incumbents, even if their opponents were pro-school choice instead of just staying out, is that he doesn't, he wants those members to, like he promised them I'll back you if you vote with me on this. So he doesn't want to renege and then risk them winning and then all of a sudden saying, well, you didn't back me, so why would I vote with you on this? Yeah. So he's trying to solidify his majority. And check all the boxes he needs to. Right. Yeah. So you know, even in races where you had two pro-school choice candidates and many of these uh, runoffs, um, at least the ones with the Abbott-backed incumbents, that's the case. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason that he's actively getting involved for the incumbents in this in this primary yeah so well wow brad we've been talking for a long time did we hit everything we hit everything well then we don't have to have another podcast a month from now yeah we can just probably just do one and done that kind of defeats the purpose of it, this continuous line of argument between yes us. but although it was not even a line of argument i think we were pretty uh helpful to each other yeah we'll see how that continues i don't know if it will I think well, this was fun. It, it was. I hope our listeners enjoyed it. It was fun to go Primary post-mortem. Yeah, primary yeah. post-mortem. That's, that's, hey, that's the title. Yeah. It should be. Yeah. Um, that's what I have in the, in the document. I don't know oh, if you, wow. you know, looked. I didn't read that, no. <sighs> um, Brother. But yeah, hopefully our listeners enjoyed it. It was nice to go deep on stuff rather yeah. than just these quick five-minute segments we do in the weekly roundup. But. And going forward, that's what we want this pod to be. We want to even go back and look at previous things that have happened in Texas political history, um, like the Bonin scandal, whatever it might be, and kind of go in depth on this kind of stuff. Yeah. It's always fascinating. Hopefully it's found useful. Yeah, absolutely. Well, folks, thanks for listening. Brad, thanks for being here. Thanks for having I'm me. You hosted this one. Apparently. Lord in heaven. But you kind of hosted this one. So thanks that's for That's true. So why are you taking my sign off? I don't know. I just naturally do that. Brad, you sign off. You're doing a really good job. <laughs> Well, thanks for listening, and we'll catch you next time. <laughs>